Jimmy Dulan Bacchus. I hope everyone's doing well today. Thanks for tuning in uh, for our Investor Fireside interview series we'll, uh, with uh, Gil Beta. Uh, please introduce yourselves in the chat, uh, drop your title, the business you're running, and you in your location where you are. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat as well, and we will get to them at the end of the interview. Uh, for those of you that are new to Entra, Entra is a social network for entrepreneurs. Uh, so we can connect, collaborate, uh, share resources and knowledge. Uh, our app is actually out. Uh, we've been working on it for over a year and a half. Uh, just check out joinentra.com and we'll drop it in the chat here. Uh, definitely, we're, we have iOS, Android, and the web version. So definitely check it out. Um, it's, we have a few thousand subscribers already and we're growing pretty fast. Uh, we also host several events each month, workshop, founder interview series, investor interview series, panels, and pitch competition. So I'm going to drop that link in here. Uh, we have a great show lined up with Gil. Uh, super excited. Uh, Gil, thank you for coming. How are you? I'm also going to drop in your LinkedIn here. I'm assuming that's how you like everyone to connect yeah, with you. Is it That's fine. Okay. Yep, that would be great. And, and if you okay. want to connect, just let me know that. You heard me, saw me speak here, um, and uh, happy to connect. Uh, so Gil uh, Beta, you're, you, it looks like uh, you're, I'm gonna tell a little snippet of what I've gathered. Uh, you started as a software developer, you turned CTO uh, and founder uh, of a company, uh, several companies, then you turned investor. You're currently managing director of Comcast Ventures, founder and managing partner of uh, Genocast Ventures, which is a seed round uh, uh, venture firm, right? Yep, absolutely. Awesome. And so I'm happy to get some more details if you, if you want on that, or we can keep Absolutely, going. absolutely. Yeah, go yeah. for it. Yep, yep. So um, I look at my career sort of in three phases, 10 year phases. The first 10 years, I was a software engineer consulting to multinational corporations. Then the next 10 years, I was founder, CTO of a couple of tech companies in New York. Uh, and then the last actually 12 years, um, I have been uh, in venture capital. First, starting Genicast, which is Comcast seed fund to do million dollar B2B uh, enterprise checks. Uh, and then uh, I'm also a partner at the main fund to do the series A and beyond uh, two to 20 million size investments. Awesome. And just Fantastic. a quick note about the funds, uh, even though we're affiliated with Comcast, it's a financially focused fund. So we look for great companies with, in great spaces and, and uh, hopefully great outcomes. Uh, so companies we invest in don't have to have anything to do with Comcast or NBC, Universal, Sky. Uh, but certainly if there's that potential, we can hopefully uh, open those doors and, and, and try to make something happen. Fantastic, Gil. Um, before we jump in, I do have to share a story. You and I have met I don't know if you remember this. Uh oh, you was that sober? Uh, well, yeah, you, you must. It was in the afternoon. I'm assuming you were. Uh, I don't know. It was uh, 2009. I I saw you at the New York City Entrepreneur Seminar at Bloomberg. I met you. You you were on a panel. You you had uh, you were really you were great. So I asked for your email. We connected. I went to an event two days later, you were on that panel. Two days later, I went on another one, you were on another panel. So I sent you an email, I said, how many panels are you on this week, you know? But it was Entrepreneur Week and you were on uh, a few panels, so. Uh, well, that's great, thank well, I'm you. glad you I, came up and, and said hello. Um, you know, we, 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 I specifically try to make myself available. Um, yeah, I love hearing from entrepreneurs and hearing great ideas. Um, that, that's sort of the, the, the best way to, uh, to strike up a relationship. Absolutely. And it was, it was nice that you were very warm and welcoming, like not that many investors aren't, but back in 2009, startup wasn't really a thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and yet you were, you understood what it took because of your experience and we'll go into that. Um, but your approach was different and, and cause I met a lot of investors around that time and you were one of very few that were welcoming and answered and responded to a young entrepreneur like myself. So I want to say thank you for that. Yeah, um, with pleasure. And, and by the way, so thanks. Thank you everybody for, for joining us here. I'd love to see videos. You know, if you're, if you're closed and uh, you're not, not running around, 
Uh, but if not, it's, I don't take it as an insult, but it's just nice always to see some, some, uh, some faces. Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us and, and the other folks. Awesome. Fantastic. Um, so I wanted to begin with, because you have an interesting background. You're an entrepreneur. You, first, you were an entrepreneur. Then you became an investor. Uh, to say that's not always the case, right? Uh, sometimes you're an entrepreneur and then sometimes you're just an investor. So I'd like to go back to, I wouldn't say your childhood, but growing up, you know, what led you to be, did you have entrepreneurial individuals around you uh, growing up? Uh, I, I would say that I get my entrepreneurship definitely from my parents. Um, my, my mother was a, an immigrant from Israel uh, didn't finish high school. My father was uh, from Brooklyn, uh, didn't finish college as well. Um, and so they were always starting business, clothing businesses, shops, stores, what have you. Um, and, uh, and I would also work in those shops, uh, sometimes selling women's clothing and, or what have you, whatever we were selling that day. Um, and, and so two things I learned. One is that um, uh, the appetite for risk. Uh, you know, we were always taking risk in our family. We were always overextended, taking risk, and somehow with hard work, uh, it seemed to, uh, to, to work out. Um, and then, and then the, the, the second thing was um, that it's so important to understand what's the worst thing that could happen, right? And the worst thing that could happen is okay, maybe this business doesn't work out, you have to downsize, move into an apartment or what have you, but, but you know, you know if, if you're willing to work hard, um, especially here in, in America, um, it's rare that, that you'll, you'll end up on the streets. Not to say that it, it, it doesn't happen and it's tragic when it does. Um, and so if you're willing to accept the worst that could happen, um, then uh, the sky's the limit. And, and, and you really have that, that, that uh, ability to take risk. And that translated directly um, when I met my, my wife, my now wife, and, and we had kids. Uh, we were always taking risks. Um, we moved to, to, to Hong Kong and worked there for a while. We moved to Belgium when we had a one and a three-year-old. Um, you know, so we were always willing to continue to take risks because what's the worst thing that could happen? Um, and so I think that was a great lesson that I, that I learned from my parents. Fantastic, awesome. And um, how did that translate? So you jumped to when you got married, but leading up to that, you came out of high school, you went to college. Where did you first touch like entrepreneurship yourself? Yeah, I was, I was always starting businesses. So, so my first business, and this goes way back, maybe when I was 10 or 11. So in the early days when my parents were struggling, um, they would go to, don't know if they have it as much on the East Coast, but they have it on, on the West Coast, swap meets, which essentially drive-in theaters that during the day, um, they would rent out each of those spots and people would just go there and sell things. And a lot of those swap meet spots where you would sell new, new um, items, not necessarily, you know, like garage sale items. So they would go, uh, each of them would fill up the station wagon and go to uh, one of these swap meets. And there was one day that um, I remember it vividly, uh, they gave me my own spot. So it was a way, way away from where they were. And I had a, um, a card table, fold up card table, with uh, beaded purses uh, and belts. And um, probably way before a lot of your times, I don't know, maybe they're coming back. And um, I sat there all day making change, making sales, bargaining with people. I was 10, 11 years old. And um, I think I made like a hundred, hundred and fifty dollars and loved it. It was awesome. Um, and that sort of set me on a path of starting probably a dozen companies. Uh, some of them were uh, uh, ones where it was a, um, uh, a, a medical office software. 
Another one was trying to build a, a stock exchange. Another one was a you know, real estate appraisal service. Um, uh, another one was a, um, a game company for, for the original Apple II, um, an adventure arcade game. So um, I guess I'm, I'm probably known for my last two startups, Takoda and, and Real Media uh, during the 90s and 2000s. Um, but as any entrepreneur will tell you, um, and also actor and actress, right, were never overnight successes. Uh, there are always a, a, um, a series of, of roadkill, of, of failed attempts before we actually figure it out. And I think that's the, the DNA of an entrepreneur. Um, which is always coming up with ideas, um, writing them down, prioritizing them, figuring out which ones you're excited about uh, and which ones that you want to execute. I, it was funny, a little while back, I went, I went back to my list that I created, I think it was in, in, in the 80s, right? Probably before many of you were born. Um, and uh, there were some really interesting things on it. One stood out which hasn't been done yet, and maybe there are some entrepreneurs in the audience that want to tackle this, and it is popcorn that pops in the shapes of little animals. And so um, I think it would be awesome. I would, I would pay a nickel or a dime more than, you know, than, than the store brand to have it pop in a giraffe or an elephant or what have you. Um, still haven't figured it out. Maybe I can do some you know, genetic engineering or what have you. Uh, but that's what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is somebody who constantly sees opportunities, um, thinks about them, and then gets excited about one of them or many of them, and then begins executing on them. I love that. And and I I would I'm a big popcorn movie guy, so I would be you're one of the first. Who wouldn't? Uh, it would be awesome. I mean, I just feel like you go to the movies and you get one type of popcorn. I don't get it. You know, like we have craft beer. We have industries with like a hundred different types of variety, but yet you go to the movies and you get one type of popcorn. I mean, some have more, but this should we definitely be. put Orville Redenbacher out of business overnight. Yeah. It would be done. This kind of sounds like uh, Dollar Shave Club versus Gillette. You know, it's like right. a, a, it's an industry that has been untapped for so long. So um, if anybody knows how to do that, <laughs> right? Lasers, you know, genetic engineering, molds, I don't know, radioactivity, you know, let me know. So let me ask you this. Now, you, you uh, 10 years old, I had a similar, um, actually my first, uh, I, I sold, I found uh, somebody who's moving out, uh, National Geographic uh, magazines, remember those? Mm -hmm. And yeah. they, they, were, they were collecting, they had probably like a few years worth and they were throwing them out, they were moving out. And a friend of mine grabbed the table and we sold them on the street that we grew up for 25 cents. I love that, and, that's awesome. And, and, the, the, and at the end we had all this money and all I could think about is how many potato chips and, and, and sodas I can drink for a few months, you know, and that was- Just think of like the lessons that you learned from just that, right? You learned to, to interact with people, to think about products that people wanna buy, pricing, marketing, um, and then freedom, when you're you know, disciplined to start it and execute it, freedom when you actually have the cash and you can do something with it. So there, there, there's so many great lessons from, from starting even you know, the lemonade stand type business. So you have uh, children, you have a few children yourself? I do, I do. I have four daughters in their 20s. And how did you, and you don't have to talk about this, but we'd love to hear Sure. You know, have you implemented the same values that your parents implemented into you, into your, your children? I, I've tried, but it's always difficult. I think I have a sample of four, so maybe that's not enough. But, but I think it's difficult to direct um, your children in a particular direction. Right. Um, they all have their own interests, their own uh, um, talents and, and, and what have you. And um, though one of the four is actually um, a computer science engineer, so maybe there's hope for her, but, but also I think that, that um, 
you know, it, it was never a priority for me. Okay. The, the priority for me, and we're getting into sort of child rearing theory and all, was really that they become good people. I didn't care whether they had great grades, you know, whether they were successful financially. It was really about just be a good person. That's the standard. Everything else is, is secondary. And, and I take that a little bit from my uh, upbringing where my parents were always working and they sort of left me alone and I sort of figured it out. I was a terrible student, um, was a, I think, a you know, C average at, at uh, high school, C plus at university, and, but just somehow you know, figured it out. I love that. And the reason why I ask, because you know, I'm a new father and you know, I'm always thinking I'm entrepreneurial. My parents weren't, my father was a little entrepreneurial, but not so much immigrants from Europe, uh, you know, and, and they took risks and whatnot. And, and I'm, I'm just interested in like, how do I approach it as a father now with my children? And I, I have the same exact uh, hypothesis. I just want them to be good people. And if they choose to follow entrepreneurship or not, that is up to them, you know? Uh, but I was just interested. That's pretty cool. And then, so let's go back. You went to college, right? You were a C plus. I, I was probably in that same area. I feel like entrepreneurs are just not good in education. <laughs> like, not not good that, we, Probably not that we were not good is that we had a lot of other things going on. It was not a, it was not a priority, right? You know, we had, we had other ambitions than, than getting, great uh, grades. But though I must say, I did luck into a good grade one time when I was asked to write a paper on how technology, um, again, this was in the early 80s, how technology um, will impact um, society. And um, I'm a terrible procrastinator, so I procrastinated for probably three or four weeks. And it was the night before. And you're supposed to do a lot of research, like on how you know computers would impact or ATM machines, you know cash machines or I don't know whatever, right? And um, and so I didn't do any research, and so I just wrote a paper off the top of my head on how uh, um, you know this one thing called the pocket friend would it would be connected to everything, um, it would have all knowledge, you could converse with it. And, you know, and then went through all the impl societal implications and all of that. And, you know, the, the pocket friend got me like a, an A plus. Um, and so I just sort of lucked into that. And uh, it took 20 years. I think we probably have something like the pocket friend that, that uh, I had sort of made up one late night many years ago. That's awesome, uh, which is a smart point. And yep. uh, you know, you mentioned ATMs. Now, a lot of people are like, oh, ATMs. But in the 80s, that's when they were installing the ATMs. And it was like yeah. a big thing. People were like, oh, my God, the banks are, you know, they're going to have to close the branches. No one's going to go to the bank, which didn't happen. It just allowed for a better convenience. So it was very pretty revolutionary for uh, to install the ATMs. Um, this is great. So you became an entrepreneur because you were you saw it, you engaged in it, um, but what motivates you? Like, even though a lot of people might start a business and it's not for them, but you've, you started several and then now you invest in them. Like, what is your motivation? You know, I don't think it's money, is it? Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. It's, I think I, I want to do something that's interesting, that's meaningful, that and meaningful, you can number of definitions. Uh, meaningful that I can learn from, enjoy. So there's a lot of things that 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 uh, um, you know go into that. You know, something that's super interesting. I, another thing I remember from my high school days. Maybe I don't know if they still do it today, but but maybe some of you remember that they do um, like career profiling. Well, to have you fill out a, a form. And on all the things you like and you dislike, and then they come back with a readout saying, "This is the profession you can go into." Don't know if they still do that. Do they? Does anybody remember that, or is that is that way? Too I think old? they they might still do that. So mine was, you know, I, I should have you guess, but nobody's gonna ever guess. It it was a forest ranger, right? And 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 
Yeah, I've done a lot of thinking about it. I don't have like the questionnaire. I would love to have the questionnaire, but I suspect that I wrote on the questionnaire that you know, I wanted to manage my own time, right? I wanted freedom. You know, I wanted some, you know, some responsibility. I probably was fine with having, you know, open-ended responsibilities and, and uh, job descriptions and a lot of variety in, in all of that. And maybe back then, like there was not a checkbox for entrepreneur or an output that was entrepreneur. And so the closest thing was a forest ranger. So I think a lot of, I think I have a lot in common probably with, with forest you know, rangers, which is about, you know, exploring, about having uh, an open-ended job description, uh, um, you know, managing your own time, um, you know, freedom, don't have a boss, you know, you know hanging over you. Um, and, and so I, th I think I was looking for all of those things. And, um, and I think being an entrepreneur was, uh, I guess, the way that it, uh, I was able to express that. Fantastic. No, that's a, that's a, that's very interesting that, that like forest ranger, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have regrets doing that, you know, cause you could have been doing that instead of doing what you're doing here, but I think I would have loved that. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I found the quote, uh, actually I'll let you, I'm going to let you go over it, but I found something about you. You were comparing comedians to entrepreneurs. Do you oh, remember this? I, I don't remember that. You were saying, okay. And, so and probably I in six months, I won't remember that I brought up this story of the forest ranger. <laughs> so I'll tell you, so you compare comedians and say comedians spend their days uh, looking for uh, inefficiencies or just like odd things happening throughout life. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They look oh, yes. For, oh, I like that. Yeah. That's a great yeah. quote. I'm going to use that one again. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, I get it now. So, so if you think about entrepreneurs, especially, uh, so sorry, if you think about comedians, especially so like observation comedians, you know, about like what happened today or like Seinfeld or something like that, where they go around and they notice things that are odd, out of place, what have you. Um, entrepreneurs are very similar to that, but they just try to fix it rather than just make a joke about it with comedians. And we love that they do that. Entrepreneurs are, um, uh, you know, very observant about, you know, their environment, not necessarily the physical environment, but it could be, you know, any sort of environment. Uh, and they, and they translate those observations into problems that, that they try to solve. Yeah, and Thank that's you for reminding that, me of that one. That's a good one. No, no, it, I saw it. And I was like, <laughs> I, I definitely want to talk myself. about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the it, it's true, and and I I go through this a lot. Wherever I'm interacting, I'm like, mm, this could be fixed. This is a problem. Why is this? Yeah. And, and sometimes it ruins vacations because you know you're on a vacation. You're like this 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 whole thing needs to be fixed, and you want to no. fix it, but you just want to enjoy your vacation. I, I think there's um, also a second version of that, which is. Um, you know, there's some inventions that uh, don't fill a, a, a very specific need, at least they don't appear to, right? And, you know, everybody quotes, you know, Steve Jobs, right? Nobody asked for the iPod or the iPhone, which is totally true. You know, he told the market, like, what, what it needed. And so I think that that's sort of second level entrepreneurship when you see something that nobody else sees, and then you fill a demand that nobody else knew that they needed or, or, or point out a problem that nobody else thought that they had. But is that harder? Second level, is that harder to do than the first level? Yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Because the, the first level might be obvious to a lot of people. They just don't know the solution. And so an entrepreneur sees a problem that a lot of people face. And then they, the the inspiration there is how they how they fix how they fix that problem, and then second level would be noticing something nobody else notices and coming up with the the, uh, the you know the fix for it, like popcorn in the shape of animals is a second level problem. Nobody knows that they need popcorn in the shape of animals except for I haven't figured out the second part of that, which is now delivering popcorn in the shape of animals. 
Right. But now it's going to be on all your minds every time you're going to you're going to be disappointed when you you know make popcorn and see it's just in these random shapes. When we're done here, at, right after this, I'm going to actually pop popcorn and I'm going to look at them and see if any of them can match animals. And I'm I'm going to try to figure it out while we're <laughs> later tonight. It's going to be a Rorschach um, test. So, <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about uh, I, what I heard is from all the companies that you started, they're in all different industries. You know, like how do you? Typically, I see entrepreneurs jump into one industry and just kind of pivot around that industry. But you've gone into a few different industries. Like, how did you do that? And is there a company that you want to use as an example? Yeah, I guess for me, my talent was um, a little bit later in my career with software. And so software is like a hammer, a screwdriver or whatever. You can build anything with it. And so I felt that I had the tools that if I could just understand you know, the problem, the customer, that I could build something to solve that problem. Um, and so um, I, I, I wasn't, I, wasn't um, I guess I wasn't deterred by the industry. Now, if it was you know, something highly, you know, technical, maybe I would have, but, but, you know, in, in the early days, there were, you know, a lot of problems and still there are a lot of problems that can be solved with software. I agree hundred percent. So, so you so you had a, your, your commonality was the software and then you just figured out the solution. You leveraged technology to build that solution. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, and, uh, can you talk about the businesses that you started? So you became a software engineer and, mm -hmm. and then you became uh, technically a CTO. Um, how did you, when you started at that level, like what happened? Like, how did you, did you come in as a, a CTO? Did you have to manage businesses and deal with all the other stuff on the other side? Yep. Uh, so, I, uh, so I was the, the founder CTO of a company called Real Media. In, in the late 90s. And I was on the West Coast and um, my co-founder was on the East Coast. Um, I was doing a consulting assignment to a uh, network security company. And that network security company was um, looking to at and Ventures for funding. And um, they, Actually, I don't think they took and end up taking funding, but I was introduced to uh, um, to Brad Burnham. No, it was Fred Wilson. Oh, it's escaping. I, I think it was. I think Brad. Brad was at yeah. Brad was at AT and T Ventures at the time. Um, I've had a relationship with them since, but yeah, it was Brad Burnham, um, and I was introduced to him um, just you know for for networking, and he had been introduced to Dave Morgan, who would soon be my co-founder. And um, I was looking for new opportunities. And Brad uh, connected me with Dave, Dave Morgan. And we both just, just started to come up with ideas. Um, and the first idea that we came up with, or one of the first ideas we came up with, was a, uh, a news website that would learn your tastes and preferences and then give you more news that you liked and less news that you didn't like. Um, and, and, uh, and so that was the, that, that was the um, essential idea. And then something interesting happened where we tried to figure out, okay, how do we get paid? And so we could figure out, okay, well, we could, you know, subscribe, you have subscribers, we can have a, you know, pay-per-view, or we can have it paid for by advertisements. And again, this was the, this was, you know, mid, mid nineties. And we kept coming back to the business model of ad supported news website. And then we, we, we changed directions a little bit and figured, well, guess what? If, if we're going to need an ad supporting infrastructure, there are other sites out there that are going to need ad supporting infrastructure. So at that point, we pivoted 
And rather than create this learning news website, we created uh, real media, the ads, you know, an ad server and, and, and an ad network. Uh, so at that point, um, we decided, okay, we're all in, you know, let's um, create an ad server company, which, which we did. Um, and at that time I was living in Studio City in Los Angeles. We, my wife and I packed up the kids. We had, we had two girls at the time. You know, honey, we're, we're moving to Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, which is, you know, where we got free office space. So uh, we got free office space. We were just supposed to be uh, there for a year or two. And um, I'm, I'm still here today, 20 years later. Wow, <laughs> amazing. And, and you had children, and I know you said that you and your wife took risk, but like that's that's got to be. I mean, there's no guarantee. There's no there's no paycheck. I mean, did you raise funds like? For this I think business? we raised I think a million dollars at that point. And then you started hiring. So let's talk about that. So you this is is this your first venture where you raised money and started hiring up, or is this your second? Yeah, this is the first one that that I raised external capital for. So now you go, you pitch, uh, they love the idea, they, they fund it. Now you have to scale up, you have to hire. What was that process like? What, what did you have to do to get that going? Oh, it was terrible. I knew nothing about hiring people. I knew nothing about managing people. So by that point, um, I had a, a bachelor's in computer science and I also went back and got my MBA. Um, but it was all, all book learning. And uh, so I, I did my best to, you know, to find people who were smarter than me, who knew what they were doing. I didn't know what I was doing, who knew what they were doing that I can learn from and they can help build the company. Um, and, you know, and it was really interesting at the early days of real media, we hired, these weren't the days where everybody wanted to work for a startup yet. So we almost pretty close to hire anybody who would work for us. Um, and so one guy who worked for us was, was in a band. He was, I think, the guitar player in a band. Uh, I don't think the band was doing too well. Another guy we hired worked for a utility company cleaning out sewer pipes. Um, another guy we hired was a buddy of mine from LA. Um, and we just started putting together a ragtag team of folks who would figure it out. Um, and it actually worked out really well because what we didn't know was the online advertising industry in the mid nineties, everybody was figuring it out. So like maybe you knew about finance or maybe you knew about management or maybe you knew about i don't you know support and what have you but like those were the easy things to figure out back then because you could actually you know hire somebody with that knowledge or read it in a book or make some mistakes and figure out you know how to do payroll or whatever but the things you couldn't figure out really were were required people to think out of the box and guess what? We hired a lot of people that lived, worked outside the box. And so we, I think we were able to move really quickly because we had a, a bunch of um, folks who were not tied down to, you know, with institutional knowledge and were able to think totally outside the box and help us you know, solve problems. And you, and you as the founders, gave them the freedom to, to, to test things and to uh, try stuff out, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I'd like to think that is because we were so smart, but I think we didn't know any better. Like we were just a, a bunch of folks trying to solve all these problems, right? And, and, um, and it was really a very flat organization, very team oriented. You know, I did another startup with my same co-founder, Dave Morgan, and we had learned a lot by then. And I think we, uh, we, we made less mistakes the second time. Yeah, it's always, that's always the case. The first time you make a lot of mistakes, but 
you know, and, and that's really a lot of entrepreneurs will, will start their first company, not a lot, but a portion of them, and they'll just say, you know what, I just don't have it in me. But you just gain so much knowledge that first startup, but some of them say, you know what, I'm just going to go get a job. And that, you know, it takes a little while, then they realize, no, then they come back into the, into the mix. Um, so let's talk about, so uh, the uh, real media was acquired, right? Yes. Yeah. Real okay. media was acquired so in, in 2001 by a company called 24-7 and they became 24-7 Real Media. Um, and then a few, uh, I think three or four years later, they were bought by one of the large agency holding companies, WPP. So let's talk about that. 2001, you get an offer from this company to purchase your company. What happened, like what went through your head and, and then how did you deal with it after? Yeah, um, it was bittersweet. We had tried to um, go public um, in, in 2000, um, but the stock market you know, tanked, if many of you remember that. Um, and we were you know, slated to go on our, our road show to go public to IPO. Um, and that was the week, I think it was April of, of 2000, that, that, you know, the market absolutely tanked. Um, and, um, and, and so that, I, I think that would have, the IPO would have allowed us to really continue the vision, to fill out the vision and extend the vision of the company. Um, in 2001, um, uh, you know, we were acquired, which is a great thing. Very grateful for it. Um, it, it was it was a good outcome, uh, but the vehicle was did not allow us to uh, fulfill what we believe was was the vision. We are now fulfilling the vision of the acquiring company, um, and so neither my you know my my co-founder or I um, stuck around for that. Um, you know, we made sure that, you know, it was, it was a happy marriage and um, uh, ju just by the, the fact that, you know, some years later they were acquired for, you know, a much larger amount by, you know, a, a, a large public company means I think that we um, were successful. And, um, and I think if you ask them, they would think that the acquisition was very successful. So um, I think we did our part in delivering a great business, a great asset to that company. Um, but my co-founder and I were not yet willing to, um, uh, you know, to work on somebody else's vision. Uh, and we still had other ideas. Okay. And, and what happened after, so you, you are now, you, the company sold, did you take some time off? Did you kind of rediscover yourself, you know, like a lot of entrepreneurs do after an acquisition? Uh, no. Yeah, anytime I'm not working, I'm panicking. And um, I, I'm always worried that, um, that, that I'm not gonna have another idea or nobody, is going to listen to me. No one's going to remember me. I mean, everything moves so quickly that um, you know, my, my skills, uh, you know, you know, you know, atrophy or or technology moves on, and so I was always worried. And this is the same thing that happened to me after I sold my second company, Dakota. Uh, I didn't sit around uh, for long at all. Because uh, I felt that, especially if you're a technologist, technology moves very quickly. And unless you're in the game, it could very easily pass you by. Um, Interesting. So my co-founder went ahead of me and started a company called Takoda, which is in sort of the next generation of advertising, behavioral advertising, you know, targeting ads to people who exhibited you know, certain online browsing behavior. Uh, and then I joined him, um, uh, you know, the, I think the, the following year. Awesome. Fantastic. Yeah. And, and, 
I, I understand that. I, I have like, it's called the, uh, it's like fear of missing out, FOMO, yeah. right? They call it. It's like, you, if, you know, every minute that you're not in the game, it's like years that you're losing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of part of your motivation too, is to keep going, keep learning and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I did, I did come across a quote, uh, you wrote, Reg regularly feeling stupid followed by learning something new. Is, is that your, is that your quote? Yes. Yeah, it is. And I do remember that one. <laughs> that, that I think is, is sort of a mini mantra for me is that I'm really not afraid of feeling stupid. And especially in the venture business, I feel stupid a lot. And that's okay. Um, uh, because if it's something I'm interested in, if I feel bad about being, you know, stupid or not knowing something, I'll learn about it. And here's a you know, perfect example of it. And I'm not ashamed because a lot of people are stupid when it comes to quantum computing or quantum physics or quantum mechanics. And I have a software technical background, so I don't know anything about hardware, don't know anything about physics, chemistry, like I failed all of those classes there. But I made an investment last year in a company called Zapata Computing. And they're in the quantum computing space. And for those of you who, who haven't heard of quantum computing, basically it's that next generation of computers. It's not going to make these cl the classical computers that we all know and love, it's not gonna make them obsolete, but it's gonna allow for problems to be solved that are impossible even with all the computing power in the world. Um, and, and quantum computer at scale, we're not there yet, but we'll be able to solve that in minutes or seconds. Um, and it'll be revolutionary when it comes to uh, materials design, uh, pharmaceutical discovery, um, oil and gas, chemistry, finance, it'll touch almost every industry. So I decided, okay, two years ago, I wanna make an investment in quantum computing. And that was the better part of a year that I felt so stupid. Um, because I was talking with, you know, quantum physicists and, um, uh, you know, folks who really understood, like, what's happening at the subatomic level. And I am still a kindergartner when it comes to quantum computing, but I was able to learn enough to create a, a thesis, an investment thesis around quantum computing and to, to make that investment. So for me, um, that was a challenge. It was a challenge to jump into a space that uh, I knew nothing about and could I train myself up enough not to be a quantum physicist, not to, not to write quantum algorithms or anything, but to get that confidence enough that I can, um, you know, write a check. That's fantastic. I mean, I'm not an expert in quantum uh, physics or, but I know that we are more, we're capable of more than we're doing right now. There's, or there's advancements that are underway that can change the way we live uh, in, in, in all sectors. And I'm, I'm pro that I'm pro technology. Um, I, I feel like if technology can create convenience or, or, or help you in your life, it's good. It's not good if it's a distraction, which sometimes it is. Sure. Um, but let's talk about, um, so you, you invest now, you're in, you transition from founder to investor. Let's touch a little bit on that. Why did you do that? And then transition into what do you look for when you're working with entrepreneurs or investing in these companies? What's your criteria? Yep. So I got into venture um, because in addition to being CTO at Dakota, my last company, um, I was head of uh, corp strategy, corp dev, and ran our fundraising process in, in 07. So in 07, we were out fundraising. I ran that process. I, I met a bunch of VCs. We ended up being acquired by, by AOL. Um, uh, and, and one of the VCs that, that we had pitched who were interested in, in investing was Comcast Ventures. And at the time, Comcast Ventures wasn't doing um, uh, seed stage investing. And so after I, I left Dakota after the, the acquisition, uh, we started having a conversation about, hey, let's start a fund. 
um, and both contributed capital. So we started Genicast Ventures um, in 08. Uh, Comcast Ventures is, a, is an investor in the fund. I'm also personally an investor in the fund. And um, that's how I got into, in, into ventures, really a trial by fire. Um, I guess um, I was lucky to get into it in 08, even though it was, uh, you know, our, our economy was, was on the brink. Um, but uh, because that was 08 and 09 were some of the best years for investing. I, I had some great exits from companies that, that um, I invested in those years. We can, we can, we can talk about why. Um, and then, uh, so I've been running Genicast for the last 12 years and then uh, uh, doing seed stage million dollar checks um, in B2B enterprise companies. And then uh, a few years ago, in addition to that, I joined the main fund, Comcast Ventures, to do the, you know, the two to 20 million size checks, Series A and, and beyond. So that's, and uh, I see you're on the board of several companies. Um, how does, what does that look like when you're on the board of a company? It's like, so the VC invests, let's say, we'll, we'll talk about seed because a lot of the viewers mm -hmm. here are, are startups. Uh, so, you know, you cut a check. I, I think you cut checks from like 100,000 up to, you know, whatever, uh, 5 million. Is that the range usually for pre for seed or is for it seed, less? Yes. The, our average check is a million, probably half a million right. to a million dollars. So what interesting, you, you should mention, you, interesting you should mention, you know, boards uh, and all. So it ties into one of the reasons why I wanted to get into venture. So I had already done a couple startups and been lucky enough to have, have uh, you know, gone through the process of being there early, growing the company and exiting a couple of times. I love that. It was amazing. Most people don't get to do it once. I was so grateful, lucky to have been able to do that twice. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I wanted to still be involved in startups and early stage companies. Uh, but I, I didn't have any ideas and nor was I ready to, to start another company of my own, unlike my co-founder, Dave, who actually started another company, which is doing really well. And he's a glutton for punishment. Um, uh, I, I wanted to be involved in startups. I wanted to, to help them grow and, and build. I felt like I had something to contribute there, but I didn't just want to be an advisor or a consultant or, or what have you. Um, I think for me, in order to make it exciting, I need to have some skin in the game. And what's the best way to have skin in the game? It's actually have some of your personal money um, into some of these companies here. It's really motivating when you know like your kid's education is on the line here. This company's got to do well, um, and and so that's why that that's why um, I thought that the venture model was right for me in continuing to be involved with with startup companies. But I had to I had to get um, comfortable with sort of three things. And if I could use the, the the metaphor of horse racing. So one is. Um, I wasn't going to be the jockey. So I had to get comfortable with, okay, you know, I'm not in the, the driver's seat. Um, could I still believe that I can impact and feel that, that I'm, I'm, I'm adding meaning uh, without being in control? And so I had to, that was one thing I had to get comfortable with. Two is, so if you look at, um, you know, another role in the horse racing metaphor is the trainer, right? So could I identify, you know, good jockeys, good horses, and be able to contribute to make them run faster, stronger, longer, right? And, and, I, and I felt that I did have something to, to, to add there. I could, quote unquote, you know, train um, entrepreneurs or help train them. And, and then the third one is, you know, could I be a good cheerleader, right? Someone in the stands. The, my role, even though I, I invest in the company, it's I'm on the board, at the end of the day, we have a minority position. It's the CEO's company. 
it's their vision that we're going to execute, not my vision. So even though it's not my vision, could I still be a cheerleader? Could I still support the company? Um, still, you know, could I still get excited? And just sort of a sidetrack here is one of the first pieces of advice I got um, from a storied investor in, in New York was, Gil, you've been an entrepreneur. It's been your, it's been your mission um, previously to come up with the ideas and execute the ideas and to come up with vi the, the vision for your company. Now you're working with entrepreneurs and they're not gonna execute your vision, they're executing their vision. So you either have to do two things. One is believe in their vision, or if you don't believe in their vision, still be supportive of, of those companies because they're not going to, oh, and the, I guess the third option is have them change their vision to your vision, right? Which, which rarely happens. So, so I think it was great advice in trying to make that transition from being the visionary to the, maybe the vision influencer and supporter. That's interesting. That's fantastic. And any, uh, any good stories uh, being on the board, anything, I know you're not allowed to disclose uh, uh, meetings and whatnot, but anything uh, else that you learn from the startups, like being on the board? Yeah, it's, it's a really delicate relationship. Um, and th that's why I like being on the board. I like being on the board for early stage companies or you know, C or Series A, because there's a lot to do. You have to figure out you know, what is the product? How do you put the team together? What's the go to market? Um, you know, how do we fundraise? So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of things, that, a lot of decisions need to be made. The later you get, you know, to a theory D, E, F, the company's already in place, the team's more or less in place, and you're just sort of sitting on the audit committee or the comp committee and just making sure that, you know, that things are, are, are moving forward. But, but there's not a lot you can contribute to product in a, you know, Series E company. So I, I really enjoyed the early stage companies. Uh, and, and I had to come up to speed on like what value could I add as, as, a, as a board member? Um, you know, a question you asked earlier that I never, I never got into, but both at Real Media and Dakota, in, in addition to being the CTO, um, I ran our ad server line of business. So I had um, product, marketing, support, engineering, um, uh, sales, all reporting to me. So I ran a full company. My co-founder, he ran another part of, of the business. So um, I, was, I wasn't just a technical guy. I, I was a technical guy who soon became a business guy. Um, and I think that's helped me in venture to bridge that gap between awesome technology and awesome business opportunities. Uh, but sitting on a board, it's, it's a delicate balance because you're an advisor to the company. You do have some influence um, and you're not the expert. You're, you're, maybe you're in the expert in SaaS businesses or D to C businesses or, or what have you, but you're not the expert in quantum compute, building a software company in quantum computing or building a, a um, wireless mesh networking company. Um, or in an AI ML acceleration company. You're not an expert in, in that space. Maybe after a few years you will be. And so you have to be careful um, to walk that fine line uh, between um, you know, uh, advising and um, you know, trying to direct the company. No, I, I, I gotta thank you. That was a really good insight into like the relationship between the you know the board members and the entrepreneurs and it's not always that simple i think your approaches might be slightly different from several um and i think things are changing more towards your approach because i think it's been proven to be more successful um i do want to touch back something you, you did mention that you were running the business you took over a lot of stuff 
I guess my question is, how did you do that? What was your confidence? Like, how did you know you can execute that, right? So a lot of entrepreneurs, we get into it and then the business starts scaling. We raise some money and before we know we're in the next phase and we're in the third phase and things are cranking and we're super busy. But then at one moment, you're kind of like freaking out saying, um, I don't know if I can do this. And all these people have trusted me to get here. How can I get this done? So how did you do that? I, you know, I, I hate to trivialize it. <clears throat> I didn't have a choice. Um, you know, I, I didn't have, you know, th there was, there was, you know, I couldn't hand it off to somebody else. Um, uh, I didn't want to hand it off to, to, to somebody else. Um, I, I wanted to figure it out. Um, it was you know, one of the things I like about being an entrepreneur. It's, you know, it's a, it's, you know, a high wire act every day. Um, and that's part of what's exciting about it, dangerous, but exciting about it. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to feel that. I wanted to participate in that. I, I, I wanted to figure it out. Um, as the company grew, um, we began hiring folks who had much more experience in each of those uh, departments, um, which was a great help. And not only did they clean up some of my, the mess that I create, but they, they were um, equally as valuable in teaching me um, what does a good sales organization look like? How do you hire, fire, build a great sales organization? What, is, what does marketing mean? You know, how do you provide great customer service? How do you deliver great products on time that delight customers? So um, as I brought uh, more uh, experienced people on board, um, I, for me, it was uh, I don't know, a, a PhD. In, in entrepreneurship, they taught me uh, a lot about um, you know, what they do and, and how to do it right. So I want to touch on two things and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll start uh, wrapping up uh, uh, another segment at the end of that. But I wanted to talk about um, what's the strategy on raising money. So you were in charge of raising money for, um, you said the second venture, the yeah. second business, and then, uh, scaling the business and, and it doesn't have to be in your personal opinion because now you've invested in several startups. So this could be like a variety of both you as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and also what's going on now. Yep. Uh, so fundraising strategies. Um, first thing I would try to find investors who um, would be receptive to your startup. Like they invest in that sector, they understand your business model. Um, maybe they've invested in, you know, in in similar companies, um, uh, and, and also your stage. So you know, stage, sector, geography, what have you. Make sure that there's some alignment, uh, just so that right off the bat, there's your story may resonate with them, right? And, and, and make a list of those investors. And so let's say come up with you know, 20 investors that, that you think meet your criteria and rank them on like the top is the one that you want the most and the 20th one, you'll take their money only if nobody, if everybody else says no, right? And then here's, here's, the, here's the, you know, the, the, the cheat, right? Start at the bottom, cut your teeth and practice your pitch at the bottom, right? Because by the time you get through 20 pitches to the top, you want to have this thing like nailed down. You want to make sure that, that um, every question that could be asked has already been asked and you have an amazing answer and that you're so polished and, you know, and, 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 you know, the story is, you know, well fleshed out uh, and all. Um, so that's sort of, you know, cheat number one is, you know, start at the bottom. Two is um, VCs don't chat with each other. So don't worry. I mean, don't ma make a fool of yourself, but, but don't worry about failing at, at VCA because 
VCB is a brand new start. Like they won't know how badly you did on at, at VCA, right? And so, um, you know, feel free. That that's why you need a lot of a lot of uh, I guess filler VCs to, to sort of practice. And and also, and don't worry about our feelings and don't worry about wasting our time, right? Um, this is what we do. We listen to companies. Most of them we say no to. Some of them we say yes to. Um, and uh, so even if it turns out it, maybe it's not the perfect fit, but you're going to pitch them anyway, do it. And who cares if you waste their time? Who cares if you waste my time? Right? This is my job. It's my job to, you know, to hear companies uh, and all. Secondly, I think in the pitch, it's super important that you're not in sales mode. You need to be in listening mode. Most investors through the conversation will tell you through their questions, areas that they're uncomfortable with, that they don't understand, that are confusing or what have you, right? You need to be able to pick up on those cues and in real time, be able to answer those questions. Um, and also, I think it's important to understand the job of that first meeting is not to get a check. Nobody gets a check in the first meeting. The job of that first meeting is simply to get them interested enough that they want to learn more and, and get to a second meeting, right? And that's how the relationship goes. Second meeting, get to the third meeting, et cetera. And then I think the, I guess the, 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 the I have lots of advice, but, but I'll keep it short. Probably the, the last piece of advice is that um, the VC will never be an expert in your space. But that being said, they probably have seen other companies similar to yours. And I can't tell you how many times I've been pitched and I look at the competitive landscape slide and it's missing somebody that I know should be on there, right? And here's the impact of that. So first off, you're the expert and you're pitching me the company. I've been in your space all of 10 minutes. And if I'm able to identify a competitor that you didn't put on your slide, it, it, I, think it, I, I think it degrades your, your credibility. Like, okay, like that's one thing that I got you on. Like how many other things in this presentation, because I'm not an expert, um, uh, you, you know, I, I didn't have an opportunity to, to, to fact check on it. So just make sure that, you know, everything in your presentation is really buttoned down um, and, uh, you know, competition and market size and things like that, they're all, you know, well done because it's an easy no if somebody, if, if a VC, you know, finds some, some errors in your pitch when they're not even an expert in, in your space. I love this. And, and uh, the, first, what you just mentioned about, you know, your job is to, to, to figure out this is a sound investment, right? That there is potential to grow and, and to, to, for you to make a return, right? You're not, this is not charity, right? You're not putting in the money for goodwill because uh, you want to see a return. Uh, and when you mentioned about VCs not communicating, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs just think everyone knows each other, but I'm sure with all the decks that everyone's seeing, they can't even keep track of half the time of what they saw and they liked, they didn't like. So there's, there's, that's an interesting point. And I like that the fact that like, you know, the first appointment is not to get the check. It's just a, a reiterate, like, here's my story. Here's what I'm doing. Are you comfortable to continue this with me? Do you think I have potential? I like you, we, you ask great questions. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So that's interesting you said that. Um, what about scaling? So now you raise some money, uh, you have money indoor. How do you scale? Like I know you mentioned that you, you hired, you know, some, some out of the box thinkers in your business, but how are they doing it now? Like, is it different? Are people doing that? Are they hiring experts? Can hiring experts affect you? Sorry, I'm not, I'm, I just asked you like three questions at once. <laughs> Yeah. 
Scaling is a very difficult question. Um, it's, it's almost very specific to like an individual business because they all scale in different ways. Um, you know, I like to invest in businesses that are able to cheat in the marketplace. So unlevel that playing field and have a competitive advantage against other people because there are so many things that can go wrong. So many mistakes that you're just inevitably going to make that it's nice to have a, you know, a, a, a way that um, you have an advantage in the market that maybe nobody else has. And it's very difficult to come up with that. Uh, but when I see businesses that do have that competitive advantage, right, you know, it, it get, it's, it's really exciting because it means that they can short circuit, they can do more on less capital, right? They can compete with other folks who may be in the space or may want to go into the space. Um, it, it allows them potentially to scale faster. Now, some businesses don't naturally have a way to quote unquote cheat in the market, um, but it's worth each business trying to figure out what is that? And maybe it's their business model. Maybe it's a freemium business model. Um, you know, maybe it's, um, uh, you know, a, a land and expand type, type uh, opportunity. Maybe it's some technology that allows them to do something that is very difficult or expensive without that technology. Um, so I think it's, a, it's, a hard, it's hard to answer the question but I think if you can spend some time and, and, and answer it, that um, it could really be a, a game changer for, for the business. I love that. And um, my next question is the framework of startups or, or a company. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like how to structure like framework for successful businesses? I, and I know it's a vague question, so yeah. you could pick a scenario <laughs> Uh, so let me, you let me think... tell you a little bit about the company, the, t the, the types of things I look for in um, a potential investment, right? So one is I look for the team, right? It is, and everybody says this because it's true. It's, you know, do you have confidence in this team that they're willing to execute? Um, I, you know, I like to paraphrase uh, Thomas Edison when he said that, um, Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I think it's the same with a startup. A startup is 1% inspiration, a good idea, and 99% um, execution. And so when I look at a team, I, I, you know, probably I see several hundred businesses a year. I would say probably 90% of them are really good ideas. And the different difference between a good idea and a great company is execution. So can this team execute? Have they demonstrated before that they can execute? Do they know the customer? Were they a potential customer? Were they a customer of this type of solution? Do they know the space? Or, you know, can they network? Um, you know, can they hire? You know, is the CEO a salesperson? Uh, I.e., can they sell stock to an investor? Can they sell the vision to an employee? Can they sell a product to a customer? Um, uh, you know, can they sell an opportunity to a partner? Um, and so given that I'm not an expert in the space, is this team an expert in the space? And then just to rattle off quickly, a few other areas that I look at, competitive landscape, uh, you know, what is the competitive advantage of this company? Are they capital efficient? What's their go-to-market strategy? You know, are they raising enough capital that they can hit some interesting milestones that um, the next investor will be excited to, uh, um, to, to invest? I like that last part too. I mean, all this is great. Uh, raising enough capital. I feel like sometimes entrepreneurs might not raise enough. Mm -hmm. They might say, you know, let me, let me, because the whole time you're like, you're, um, bootstrapping it and then here you are able to get capital so you're like but well i don't want too much but yet you don't know what can happen so you should always raise a little bit more than you anticipate i have um, to that point i have never met an entrepreneur who said i raised too much money 
and like maybe they're out there and I'm sure they are out there. Um, but entrepreneurs by nature, and we love them for it, that they're optimistic, they're visionaries, right? They're, they're more or less drinking their own Kool-Aid. Um, we love that about them, right? But they also have to be a realist and understand that there's so many unknowns when you start a business, right? And some problems can be solved with capital. Not all your problems, and probably not the big ones, but there are some problems that you can solve with capital. Um, extend your runway, give you an opportunity to pivot, hire more talent, do more marketing, um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe at the later stage buy a competitor. So um, it's very difficult for me to convince entrepreneurs to raise more capital because heck, I'll give you more capital. I want more of your company, right? I want to put as, you know, if I'm in for a penny, I'm in for a pound. Uh, so it's difficult for me to, but maybe you guys can get the word out that, uh, you know, more capital <laughs> is better. Uh, I think COVID, um, if you want a, a COVID question is, you know, the companies that raised more capital last year um, are like thanking their lucky stars. Um, now you can't anticipate a, a, you know, a, a COVID situation where sales are flat or down and you need, you know, to, to sort of bide your time through 2020. Um, but it doesn't have to be a global pandemic. It could be, you know, a, a competitor raises additional capital and now they're going after your customers, right? It could be that your product, you know, uh, you have product visions and you can't deliver it on time, so you need more resources or, or you need more runway to, to hit your financial milestones, your revenue milestones for that next investor, right? So it doesn't have to be a global pandemic, but um, so that's my soapbox on how much- And, and, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned COVID because uh, the, the last part here is, is gonna be, you know, what's your thoughts on the current climate in, in the future of, you know, I would say startups and, and, and companies growing and whatnot? As I mentioned, at the beginning of, of this talk here, some of my best years, investment years, were 2008, 2009. Um, and this, I think, is worse than that. Um, but if you think about it, um, you know, my job, your job as entrepreneurs, is to you know, buy low and sell high. Well, it's currently we're in a trough now. And if you can start a business and it's, it's not easy, it's never really easy to, to um, start a company. It's gonna take an entrepreneur who rather than with you know, high seas and high waves, rather than you know, heading for safe harbor, they're out there you know, fighting the storm in their little tiny boat. Um, and not everybody's made up for that. We don't want everybody to be made up for that, but it takes a special person. That's the kind of person that can build a company in any environment, um, but maybe especially now because there's probably not a lot of companies getting started um, because there's so much uncertainty out there. Um, and then when, when the market comes roaring back in, in let's say three, four or five years or whatever, um, uh, you know, that company hopefully will be able to ride that wave and be in a position potentially to exit at the top of the market when, when things are, are, are going well. And do you think it's going to take three to five years for us to kind of cycle back into like a normal, like our, our the economy of, 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 of the U.S.? Like, do you think it's going to take that long? Um, I don't know. I think the good news is prior to all of this, we had a really good economy. So we know that the potential is there to, um, to have awesome growth across the board, employment um, in, in, you know, stock market in, in revenue and whatever, and like all these measures, like things are doing great. So we have a blip here. Um, and it's not because the economy had some sort of um, a fault in it that things turn south. So, we, so, so that, I guess, is the good news. It was some exterior force that impacted the economy. 
So the, the optimist in me says that if we can get the virus under control, and whether that's through vaccines or testing or, or whatever, if we can get it under control, I don't, you know, I think we can go back to, you know, eliminate this year and hopefully sometime next year we can get back to that same path before because the fundamentals of the economy haven't changed. And do you think, um, and I agree with you because it's not a financial, 2008 was the financial, you know, it was the market, it was the mortgage industry, there was, you know, um, in 2009, I'm from New York, so 2009, 9-11, that was a, a unique uh, situation that happened in that city. This is something that happened across the world, uh, which is, it, you know, it's going to change a lot, but it's creating a lot of opportunity. And like you said, if, if you're not scared to get on your little boat and go into the storm and figure out what's going on, um, you might be able to, and it's going to be hard. It's very hard. Um, what are you telling your portfolio companies now? Have you reinvested in them? Have you raised more funds uh, to in anticipation of getting back out there and, and investing? Like what is going on from basically the last few months into the end of the year? Yeah. So when this first hit back in March and April, we went through a, t a triage of our portfolio companies and figured, okay, what portfolio companies are negatively impacted? which ones are positively impacted, very few, um, but there are some, and then which ones are just gonna be okay. Um, uh, you know, not necessarily positive or negatively. Um, and, and then we figured out, th then we looked at, okay, the ones that were impacted, um, is it temporary or is it uh, permanent? And most of the impact was temporary. Um, we, we didn't have a lot of exposure in areas that I think are probably risky now with like, uh, you know, travel, um, uh, real estate, uh, restaurants, you know, what have you. You know, uh, at least, you know, my portfolio doesn't have a lot of exposure there. Um, and so, um, once we sort of did the triage and then looked at the, the impact, it's about two things. One is, um, is this still a good business? Uh, and then, okay, how can we help them survive through this? And in some cases it was adding additional funding or uh, venture debt or what have you to be able to sort of survive through next year to begin growing again. Um, uh, and all. Um, and then there were, were other companies that um, may were negatively impacted and potentially had to make a, uh, a shift. And so we would sort of help them make a shift. You know, one example of that is last year, I made a seed stage investment in a company called Confetti. Um, the URL is withconfetti.com. And um, we invested in that company. They had some amazing traction. They were creating um, events, corporate events inside um, your offices. Uh, and so they would have a, you know, a, a Star Wars Cinco de Mayo. They would have a, um, you know, a petting zoo, sumo wrestlers, uh, cheese pairing, um, you know, a terrarium making, right? So it was hands-on in office. They had, you know, um, relationships with all the, many of the top companies in, in New York. And it was a really great business, very scalable and all. You all know the punchline here, right? So uh, early this year, guess what? Nobody's in the office. Nobody's running events in the office, right? And um, credit to the team is uh, they turned the company almost 180 degrees into a virtual events company, almost overnight. And so now if you go to their website with confetti.com, you can uh, do team escape rooms and family feuds, and you can do wine tasting, and you can have pizza parties and all, all remote. 
uh, and all built on the same platform, but um, shifted towards you know virtual events. That's a pretty extreme case. That was it was live or die for the company. Who knows when in office events? Who knows when people are going to return to the office? Who knows when they do return to the office? Like, are they going to want to congregate and and you know have fun, build culture, interact, what have you? And so they um, had to reinvent themselves. And they're doing great. They're doing great. Um, companies are are looking for ways to. Uh, connect employees, not just over Zoom, but doing different things, fun things, physical and virtual. Um, so it's turned out, it's turned out great. And, and, and by the way, um, that's all the team, right? The, the team, um, that's why when we say team is number one, that's why. Um, because we want teams to be able to uh, think on their feet, I want teams to be able to um, pivot when necessary, um, because there are a lot of, lot of, lot of unforeseen circumstances in, in the whole startup world. I love that. It's fantastic. And I'm actually in the. I have a, a startup, a, a business that I've had for several years in the event business, and uh, I actually put it on pause because we weren't doing in-person events. But I, I sat back and I was watching how people were going virtually and, and now I'm focusing on experiences, how to take virtual with the experience and combine it. So that's what I'm working on now, figuring out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're going to. Huge need there. Yeah. And, um, and also it creates another revenue stream. So when things do go back to some form of normal, you have online and offline mm -hmm. and it's like now you have two revenue streams and that's back to your point where you know, if you're sitting on the sidelines waiting for things to get better, these other groups are, are kicking butt, right? Even though they might not make me tons of money, they're positioning themselves for the wave up, right? Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to jump to Q&A. Uh, we're going to pick a couple right. of questions. Uh, Patricia uh, asked, uh, who is your most memorable mentor? Oh, my God. I'm going to leave so many people off. To say one. It's kind of um, like when you win the Oscars and you only have 30 seconds and you can't thank everyone, you know? Yeah, I, I would have to say my, my co-founder, uh, you know, Dave Morgan, both at, at Real Media and, and Dakota. Uh, we had different approaches to the world. Um, I was a, a technologist. He was a, a sort of a business person. And um, uh, he had a huge impact on, on, on how I, you know, viewed the world and how we, we um, architected our two startups. Um, and he also um, you know, gave me the freedom to fail. Uh, I'd like to believe that, you know, I, I, you know, I in turn, I taught him a lot of things um, about, you know, technology and gave him the freedom to fail. But it's always nice when you're going through startups to have somebody that's, that, that, that's got your back. Um, the employees of the company, we love them, have great relationships with them, but it's a different experience if you're an employee, even if you're a senior manager, than if you're founder at the top. A lot of things happen behind the scenes that they don't know about. Um, and it's good to have somebody that has your back. You know, one quick story here at Real Media, uh, we were at uh, our holiday party, our Christmas party in New York City uh, in the Garment District, uh, or it's the Rug District. Anyway, um, and the company had enough cash for maybe two more payrolls, so maybe like three weeks. And we're still having this party because it's Christmas and we're all partying and all like that. And it was just, you know, the, the, the two of us who really knew how dire the situation was. The good news is that while we were there, the mail was delivered and there was a nice, I think $75,000 check from one of our customers that prepaid that came in the mail um, that arrived that day during the party. And so, um, you know, we ended up, you know, I guess we would have, put on a great face and celebrated with everybody else. 
really not knowing what's going to happen over the next few weeks. Um, but, it, you know, we had a special moment there because, you know, we realized how close we were to, you know, to, to you know, maybe not existing uh, uh, much longer. Um, and, and by the way, so I think that's super important with your significant other. Um, you know, my wife has been amazing through this journey here. Um, she has raised four amazing daughters. You know, we've lived in Hong Kong. We, you know, lived in Belgium. We moved out here to the East Coast. Um, and she has been super supportive of all of this. Um, and she has bought in and contributed just as much, if not more, to this partnership. Um, and I think that's super important. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, you're going to take risks. Make sure that your significant other um, uh, understands what you're doing, is involved in what you're doing, and is uh, um, supportive of it. I absolutely, I agree. And uh, like, I like to send out like a, uh, my wife uh, was working cor uh, corporate America, left recently, and, and started her own business. And I feel like the minute she did that, she finally understood what I was going through, you mm -hmm. know, and, and, and kind of, not that she didn't have respect. She had, she had tons of respect for me, but it, it changed a little bit of our relationship where she was more understanding of what was going on. She tried to understand more. So I, I agree with you a hundred percent. Um, now, have you ever had an advisor, uh, have you ever had a situation where your gut told you to go against your advisor or, or, or your mentor? Uh, did that work out or did it not work out? Uh, I can't remember all the bad decisions I've made. Um, <laughs> you know, venture is a nice business to be in. I can't say anything bad about, about venture. I love it. I think it's amazing. Um, but it's the most haunting business. And I'll explain what that means. Ever. I guess maybe if you're like a ghost hunter, maybe that's, but this business, you are haunted by every bad decision you make. Every company you passed on that gets funded, you're haunted by that. Every company that you passed on that was acquired for a billion dollars, you get, you're haunted by that. Every company that you passed on that IPOs for several billion dollars, like you get, you haunted by that, right? In the business, we have our portfolio, which is the companies we invest in. And then we have the anti-portfolio, which is the companies that we passed on. And ask any investor, their anti-portfolio far outperforms their portfolio. And we have to live with that every day. Um, I, I root for the companies that I pass on because I, you know, it's a great idea. It wasn't a good fit for us, but I think, okay, like that company should, you know, have a good chance of, of, uh, of, of being successful and all. Um, and, and, and so I'm glad that companies I passed on still have an opportunity to become great companies. <sighs> but it's tough to take. <laughs> it's tough to take when yeah, a company you passed on for you know, in hindsight was probably a, a stupid reason. And it turns out to be a great company. So I don't know many businesses where, you know, you're, you're haunted on a daily bit basis with by the bad decisions that you've made. And, and, and by the way, there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. Because I didn't invest in this one company, because I didn't like the team, or I didn't think the team could execute. So like, how do I take that learning to my next investment? Okay, let's disregard team because clearly, you know, I'm no, I'm not a good judge of team, right? Or I didn't like their business model or I think their product sucked or whatever. And so every possible criteria that, that I listed 20 minutes ago, there has been a successful company that I've seen that that sucked at one of those things. So if I was to listen to all of these companies that became successful that I passed on, I would have no criteria left. 
So you can't do anything about it. You can maybe try to fine tune some of your criteria, but at the end of the day, there's so many things, variables that, uh, that you know, make a great company. And, and as a VC, you know, we're just trying, we're just scratching a the surface. There's no formula there. I agree hundred percent. This is very valuable. Thank you, Gil. Um, I'm going to ask you one more question and we're going to wrap it up. Uh, what industries do you like in this current environment for investment? Like uh, if you started a new fund today, like where would you be putting the money in? Yeah. So this is in the lens of um, enterprise uh, because I'm on the enterprise team. I focus on B2B enterprise company. Um, and so I don't have much to say on the consumer side. So on the enterprise side, um, there are a few different things happening. So one is that from a cybersecurity point of view, it is now a, uh, a complete nightmare. Um, before people come to the office, you had a clear perimeter that, okay, we need to protect the devices in the office. Now the device, nobody's in the office. And so the attack surface is much broader. Um, people are working from home, using their laptops, using their networks, what have you, downloading software. And so I think cybersecurity is um, uh, hot. It's always been hot. It's going to continue to be hot. Um, another thing is collaboration. So we talked about Zoom here. We're on Zoom and all. Um, the first generation of collaborative tools, um, I think those are already, you know, well invested in and, and like the Zooms and, and the virtual whiteboard companies and all like that. I don't know what it looks like, but I think there's a next generation of collaboration tool that allows for people in remote areas to um, not necessarily do their, what their job is today, because I think you can pretty much execute, you have been executing on what your job description is today, but how do, the, how do we make people, how do we um, make them more creative or make them as creative as they were in the office? How do we, how, how do we have them think about innovation? How do we have them brainstorm? How do we try to have, have them reinvent their job, their business, whatever, their product? I think it's, it's a theory I have. I have no data to support it. I think for businesses to continue operating their business today, it's fairly straightforward to do that remotely, more or less. I think companies who need to reinvent themselves or continue to innovate I think it's going to be a lot more difficult for those companies to figure out how to do that when people are, are spread all over the place. Uh, and then I think the third, third area um, uh, is really around um, like what is work going to look like moving forward? I'm not, I'm not sure I have an answer for that. Like companies, large and small, old and young, are now working remotely. And you know, the, the large companies, the older legacy companies, they fought it kicking and screaming and now it's a reality and they were successful at doing that. And employees now can work from home in New York, in your New York company, or they can be in Mexico, or they can be in Peru, or they can be wherever, right? So, and once somebody, you know, believes that they can now work from anywhere, the reverse happens, which is now they can work for anybody. It used to be in New York, you work for companies in New York, more or less, or companies who had a big presence in New York. Now, both from the employer point of view and the employee point of view, it's all been shuffled up. And, and so, um, you know, I, you know, I think we're still figuring that out. Like, what does that mean when you have complete portability, job portability from the employer point of view and the employee point of view? I, I totally a hundred percent agree with you. I've been having this conversation several times with many, many people. 
uh, there's, there's the two teams, right? Team A, pro remote, you know, everyone working from wherever they want to. And then the old guard, which is, no, we need to, I mean, everyone needs to be in the office. We need to be next to each other. I'm more pro remote, not for the sake of I'm trying to disrupt how things are because you do have, you know, company culture, you do have, you know, collaboration. Um, but right now you and I have had a hour and a half conversation just as if we were in a coffee shop or in a, in a, in a meeting room and it was just as productive and yet you didn't have to leave your house and nor did I. Mm -hmm. So I think, HR is going to get disruptive. Uh, there's going to be some disruption in hiring, the process of hiring and, and sorting through all these people. Um, but I also, I think cities or landscapes of cities are going to change. There's going to be developments further out. So if I only have to go into the office two days a week, uh, normally I had a half an hour commute, now I've been an hour and a half. I'm fine with that because I only have to do it twice a week. So I think economics are going to change. I think real estate has to figure itself out, especially in New York, uh, California, where it's San Francisco, which is extremely expensive uh, mm -hmm. because you were harbor, you know, you were keeping all this great talent in one space so that they can all work together. But I have to say, I'm interested to see collaboration tools and how they justify people's work. Are people going to be paid on the hours that they actually worked? Are they going to get paid for just showing up, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the other part, right? You have a, you know, some companies have staff that work half the time that they're physically there, right? So can they be more productive? So I, I love, I love your point on this. I guess. And, but, but by the way, so I love speaking, and I'm, you know, I love speaking to you know groups of uh, of people. It's still different than having it in person, um, and. Um, I think that there is, you know, we're human beings, we're, you know, you know, th there's, there's that X factor when we're all in the same room and we're all connected and we're all interacting. And even though I'm speaking and, and you folks would be listening, if we were in a conference room, right, I think there would be a, a lot better connection. And some of that is, is, is nonverbal, um, it's uh, through body language, it's, um, you know, through whatever. Um, and, and it's difficult to replicate that um, when, we're, when we're on screens. And, and I agree. I, I, know, I, I, I know I get more from it when I'm actually able to interact with the audience and, and, and speak, look in the eyes of people in the audience. And, and you don't know if I'm looking at you, Ben, or you, Vivian, or John, right? And so there's, you know, a, 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 a much bigger connection if I was speaking and then, you know, looking at you, Ben, and then looking at you, John, and then Sandra and, and all, right? There would be that connection if I was able to look into your eyes and we would have that, we would have that connection there for, for, for that moment. And it would, it would, feed me and hopefully, you know, it would be, um, you, know, you know, interesting, you know, for, you know, for you guys as well. Yeah, you know, I, I thought this whole time you were just looking at me. Is that, is that <laughs> what you want? I hope everybody <laughs> felt that. I hope everybody felt that. I'm only kidding. Yo, thank you so and, much. And by the way, T. Any... Carter, I didn't call you out because I don't know what the T is. I mean, I guess Teresa <laughs> or Tammy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah so, no, but i do i do like when people have their their video on i know that people are home probably you know drinking having a beer because it's you know friday evening uh, and also i understand it if, if they're not but but it's always it's always fun to you know to, to be able to interact awesome thank you and is there anything else before we wrap up that you wanted to leave uh you know uh, uh mention to the audience any tools or thoughts or anything else I, i'd love to connect with, with with each of you you can either send me an email gill at jennacast.com um or linkedin but if you do linkedin make sure to, to send me a note saying that you know you saw me speak here um so that i can make sure to to, to accept it uh, and we've had that that connection uh and all and let me know how i can i can be helpful if you're starting a company or looking to start a company or what have you 
I'm always happy to, to speak with entrepreneurs and, and uh, hear their ideas. Um, and if I can be helpful, great. Um, uh, so yeah, happy to do that. Hi, Patricia. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, Gil, honestly, I have to say thank you so much. Uh, this has been a wealth of knowledge and, and insight. And I really enjoyed this interview, I have to say. And uh, I think you're fantastic. I know we went a little over. My apologies. I've just been right. asking thank a lot you. of questions here. Um, and thanks to the audience for all sticking through and listening to Gil and everything he had to say. Um, we are going to break out some breakout rooms. Um, Gil, you're more than welcome to stay on, or if you if you have a, a, uh, another appointment, no worries. Um, Unfortunately, thank I, you I, have, I have a dinner to go to. I, I, I apologize for having people over in in a few minutes, but feel free, anybody who you know gets this, you know, feel free to to uh, uh, drop me an email. I'll actually put that in the chat. Um, yeah, I just put it in Gil at at uh, genacast.com, I put yep. that in, right? Okay, yeah, you can put it into it as well. Fantastic. Yeah. So look forward to hearing from all of you. You'd be surprised how few people, after I give them the invitation to email me, don't email me, right? Um, and, but, but, but uh, feel free, one of the keys to, to um, uh, eventually getting your company funded, if that's what you're interested in, is to, you know, form a connection. And, uh, and, and so I look at this as, as a way to form a connection with you guys. So thank you so much for, for, for having me. Feel free to, you know, to reach out. Um, and uh, Jimmy, thank you for inviting me. There are great questions, and I really enjoyed the, uh, the hour and a half that we spent together. Thank you. No, it's, it's all my pleasure, Jill. Thank you, Gil. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And, uh, and I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, all. See you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.